you know, part of what I hope we're able to appreciate is, um, you know, there's so many young people that age and a little older who, uh, as as Elijah said, only time they step foot inside the church is for a funeral. And, uh, you know, we're missing out on a lot of these young folks, not only lives, but their voices and their ideas, and more importantly, their pain. So my prayer for us, uh, you know, as we not only think about the Trayvon stuff and uh, the eight-year-old who was killed yeah. this week in Oakland, but a third good, another young man was killed here in Berkeley on Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, uh, you know, these things are are uh, a reminder to us that if uh, the world's going to change, it's because we use the power God's given us to change it. Amen. And the world is, is moving on a track that we have to interrupt. Amen. And uh, my prayer is that we can all step into this space with some more intentionality. And uh, the sermon today is intended to kind of give you that extra push, amen, uh, we'll get back to uh, maybe some more of that uh, celebratory stuff in a few more weeks here, but sometimes in our biblical traditions, lament is necessary. And, uh, we don't want to run past uh, the moment that is in front of us, so let's try to spend some time thinking a little bit, praying a little bit together, how we may respond. So turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter number nine. We're gonna continue this series of preaching on revolutionary living. Acts chapter nine is page 893 in your church Bible. If you need a Bible, you can shoot your hand up. And uh, if you have any seats next to you, amen. Uh, we, we still got some few folks who may need some seats to try and close in the gaps, amen, so they don't have to climb all over you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter number 9, page 893 in our church Bibles, continuing our series on the revolutionary living hoodie theology. Uh, today we're going to continue to stay in the book of Acts. Many of us know that the book of Acts is uh, the book of Luke part 2, written by the same author. Uh, an author who has really connected and collected much of his account, not only the gospel of Jesus, but also... Uh, the account of the early church uh, to some folks who have uh, not only been eyewitness accounts, but we're able to see how the early church took the words of Jesus and actually made them live. And what we want to imagine is what does it mean for us to take these same words of Jesus and make them live? How do these words of Jesus not just become things we hear on a Sunday, uh, uh, you know, the Bible study, uh, and then our lives remain the same. But how do we actually find these words to uh, revolutionize the way we see the world? I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a revolution. Amen. Amen. And as we said in the first sermon, this revolution, what? Must be televised. Amen. Tell your neighbor, man, get your TV face on. <laughs> <laughs> Acts chapter number nine. <laughs> okay, got one. Acts chapter number nine. Here we go. Follow along with me. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way. All right. How you know you're doing something, your name is on somebody's list. <laughs> Some folk ain't looking for nothing. <laughs> Found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he would might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. 
The men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. But Saul got up from the ground, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Man, I could preach on that all day long. But I won't. Amen. Uh, so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Listen, now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, and at this moment he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so, he, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went into the house, laid his hands on Saul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. God. All right, so we're going to speak from the topic today, divine interruption. Divine in terms. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God. That's the word for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let the rest of us be. Even the hearers of this word, in Jesus' name, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, I need to be interrupted. I need to be interrupted. <laughs> now, many people have asked me, what is could he be out? Why do I use these moments as an occasion uh, to invoke religion, faith, into situations that are not explicitly religious? Have folks on Twitter and Facebook and email, some with, you know, I think deep curiosity and others with, you know, a lot of skepticism and and, and rankle, you know, kind of, you know, try to take some of us to task on why do we step into these moments the way that we do. And the way that I try to think about these things and what I hope to be relevant for us today is I believe that every situation in our life is theological. <laughs> Meaning that everything we go to is a commentary on God commentary on what we believe about God. It's a commentary on what all of this means, our belief about God in our lives. If you recall last week, as we were preaching our hoodie theology about this must be redeemed, I talked about how Christ became human so that we as humans can become like God. And that all of our lives and all of our situations are opportunities for Christ to be made known to us, not just in the abstract, in the theoretical or the esoteric, but God's way of making himself known to us is by our lived experience. Thus, it's my contention that everything we encounter is theological. And if we keep it real, every situation we encounter in the world is also about these hoodies that we got on. In a symbolic way, these hoodies can represent the kinds of things that we are always choosing to cover us, to shield us, to protect us. And how many of you know that all of us make choices about what we will choose to cover us? That whatever we depend on and whatever we put our faith in and our trust in, whatever kind of way of life I want to argue is your hood. So we talk about hood theology, we're really talking about what is it that we can learn from the revelation of God that can serve as a true covering for 
for us when we are engaging with the most difficult moments in our lives? What does it mean for us to be people who do not run from God when times get hard? Or look for help or wisdom apart from the wisdom of God? But what does it mean for you and I to appreciate it? That everything we have need of, God has made some provision for us to find help in the time of trouble. Hoodie theology at its core is about the relevance and application of God's self-revelation to us in our everyday lives and experience. And if I were just to take the hoodie at its face value, knowing that we are in this moment of perpetual death and destruction in our communities and in our world, I must observe that this hood, this physical hood, carries with it a stigma when it is attached to black and brown bodies. It is a powerful reminder to all of us that there are very few things in the world that are value neutral. That all of us ascribe worth and value to things. All of us have been shaped to ascribe worth and value to people. All of us, whether we are conscious about it or not, have figured out that not all lives are equal. And when you take a look at these hoodies we have, you got to always remember that these hoodies are nothing more than coats, sweaters, shirts that have a little bit of extra fabric on the end. And the fabric is meant to cover our faces. And the original function of these design hoodies were for workers in the 1930s who worked outside. And they needed extra covering to serve as a shield for their human faces that were battered by the external forces of the uncomfortable and uncontrollable elements of the weather and the climate. And I find it so tragically ironic that something that was originally designed to shield and protect folks from the external forces are now, today, being used as a pretext to judge and criminalize so many of our young men and women who look and share a darker hue of skin color. If there's one thing that hoodie theology must be about, it is providing us with a space to uncouple the uninterrogated assumptions about how we ascribe worth and value. It must be about you and I realizing that just like this doc, this, this garment hanging on a hanger in a department store does not have the same kind of value what someone like me puts it on. It is to appreciate, number one, that all of us in the eyes of God have been created with intrinsic value. That despite how the world may narrate who we are, God has a story that we all have been invited to participate in that reminds us beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are all gifts to one another. Yes. We're gifts to one another even when I don't feel like <laughs> being a gift to you. Somebody say amen. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I'm like, I don't really, and that gift wasn't for me. Uh, sometimes I get gifts that I love a whole lot. Not just the gift that keeps on giving. But part of what I believe our faith is trying to compel us to remember is that regardless of who you are and where you are in life, God has created you and I to be gifts to one another. Tell you that you are a gift. To me, tell them that you are a gift to me. Now, everything that I've stated is easier to acknowledge in the theoretical. But how many of you know all of us have a history and a context that makes this 
notion of gift and humanity and value, uh, you know, intelligent. I was, I admit, stunningly surprised to hear President Obama on Friday powerfully and effectively give a context and a frame for the humanity of black males and a call for our country to prioritize and figure out how do we deal with you know the, the increasing frustration and neglect of black males. I was surprised. Pleasantly surprised. I tweeted I think, praise God. But last night I saw the Fruitvale Station movie and it reminded me how context is so important. Because none of us see the world without context. As I sat in that movie with my wife, with Antonio, we went to the Grand Lake to see it yesterday. And sitting in that movie made me relive my own painful experience, being physically and sexually beat up by the police in 1999, San Jose. And as the screen was filled with the reenactment of Oscar space, being violently pinned to the ground with the knee of this police officer, Without my permission, all of my pain, fear, anger, and frustration, just like someone turned a faucet on me. And tears started coming to my eyes, and I could not, you know, I'm sitting next to my wife, and I'm trying not to like turn into a mess for you guys. You know, you know, you're in a movie, you know, you sit around other people, but as I listened, everybody was crying. Because I think all of us can appreciate that we all have pain that we can't control. And sometimes triggers will come and they will uh, uh, initiate fear, they will initiate anxiety that will cause you and I to diminish one another's humanity even without us fully being in control of what we are experiencing or encountering. And I sat there filled with anger, I sat there filled with sadness, remembering and reminding myself of the smell of the officer's breath and the words they were saying to me, and it all just kind of came back to me. And then I had a weird feeling of joy and relief and thanks that I was still alive. Because I saw how easily that could have been me. And all of us have these stories where you're standing out on the block and you had a party, you somewhere, and things go badly, and, you, and some of us have pain about folks that didn't make it, and some of us feel guilty that we did make it, and some folks have been mugged, and some folks have been robbed, some folks have been assaulted, and we have all these experiences, and we have all these pains, and we're trying to figure out, God, what do you have to say about my situation where I am? Real context that we cannot escape. But the story of Jesus gives us another context that we cannot escape. And the context of Jesus is that he was a crucified Savior who came to the world because he loved the world. And he gave himself because he loved us. But even in his own physicality, Jesus' body was broken just like Oscar's body. Jesus' body was dehumanized just like Trayvon's body was dehumanized. Jesus' body was abused just like some of her body and your body and my body has been abused. Yet Jesus found a way to go through all he went through and still have enough love at the end of the journey to die on the cross and bring salvation to the whole world. And I wanted to you know, child,
Many real folk in the house today. Amen. I mean, I, 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 it, it, it is not an accusation of guilt. It's just an accusation of being honest. Praise God. That, that, that with all the things happening in the world right now, it's easy for me to choose hate rather than love. That's right. It's easy for me to choose distraction rather than construction. It's easy for me to stay in my situation of depression and frustration. But this is where God comes in to bring you and I a divine interruption. The reset button in our lives so we can get recalibrated back to the ways of life that God has intended for you and I to live. And make no mistake about it, child of God, when God comes to interrupt you, he does not come uh, to, to, you know, rub you down and, and make you always feel good about the interruption. Yeah. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Religious leaders. 
killing up folk. But they use Saul's passions against him. So he got Saul traveling all around the region, arrested and killing up folk in the name of his faith. And I just want to remind you, child of God, that God don't need you to be his warrior. I mean, listen, I know in history we got a whole lot of records of religious wars, but my thought is, if God is God, he don't need you to fight for him. All he needs you to do is represent him well. Even to the point of death. And some of us, we, we, we want to be right all the time, so we'll fight to the death. To be right. When all God is asking you to be is faithful. Take that, you just gotta be faithful. Rather than trying to be right all the time, what it like if you just kind of walked away from that next argument? Forgive your homie for, you know, being a bad homie, praise God. <laughs> what it like if you actually forgave your wife or your mama and or your husband or your daddy and them? Rather than you holding on to that thing, God is calling for somebody to check your passions. Because your passions could be your downfall. And I believe that one of the greatest tasks of the church in the 21st century is for us to become a people who are able to control our feelings, our, our passions, and, 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 and have a sense of self-control so we're not just running all over the place, doing all kinds of crazy things, and ask God to fix it in the end. Amen. Amen. As someone asked me, Pastor McBride, aren't you worried about riots? Aren't you worried about young people doing all this, this stuff? I told them, well, I'm no more worried about them doing this crazy stuff out here than I'm more worried about you and me and us as a country because I want you to realize that we can't live in front of our young people with contradictions and expect them to do the opposite of what we're doing. We ask them how come they can't solve their problems without violence, uh, but we can't solve our problems without violence. They ask them why can't they work together, but you and I can't work together. They ask them how come we can't, uh, they can't forgive and we can't forgive. They ask them how come they can't sacrifice and go to school and delay gratification, and you and I, boy, we in debt all over the place because we had to have them shoes, and we had to have that purse, and we had to have, you know, them tickets, and, and all this other kind of stuff. You got to Check yourself. Uh-huh. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, check yourself. Before you wreck yourself. And the second thing the text reveals to us about divine interruptions is that God loves to make an introduction to us even when we're at our worst state. Yes. Yes. Somebody call it an introduction. God comes to Saul not when Saul was looking for him in a place of repentance, but he meets Saul at his worst and, and his worst state, his worst moral and ethical place. And I'm convinced that God is not interested in looking for you, uh, or God is not waiting for you to look for him. God is always on the, on the outlook looking for you. God is pursuing you. God is trying to find you. We even at your worst state. I, I hate the narrative where people say, well, Pastor, I'm just trying to get myself together before I come to God. How many of you know God ain't threatened by your situation at all? Front door 
that Saul is, is, is meeting Jesus for the first time. And, and Saul begins to inquire. He says, now, I think I know who God is, but who is this? And, and Jesus simply says, I am Jesus. I'm here to let you know that when God gets ready to make an introduction to you, he will not leave any kind of ambiguity about who he is. But he will tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt who he is. And part of what I want you to always remember is that God always reveals himself in the context of a historical revelation. If you go back to the book of Genesis or Exodus, Moses is out there in the middle of the wilderness and he's You need to go find Saul. 
God tells Ananias, listen, bro. You so worried about Saul, but I've already chosen Saul. I've chosen Saul to do things that you could never do. Some of us, our own prejudice and biases are getting in the way. Us being able to connect with the greatness in people. And I want to challenge all of us today. Stay with me, put those hoodies on for a second. I want to challenge all of us today. Be comfortable identifying with those people that are so different from you. Don't be folk who are so limited in your vision that if it don't look like you and sound like you and feel like you, you can't draw them nearer to you. As you grab the hand of the person next to you, I want you to ask God, Lord, bless my brother. Bless my sister. Give them peace and joy and victory. Whatever pain they're feeling, Whatever struggle they're enduring, whatever situation they're encountering, help them to see and to know that you have the power to interrupt them and put them back on the right track. Do it today, God, because we need your interruption. Our lives are spiraling and out of control in places that we cannot handle what God I know and I believe and I declare that you are able to hold my brother and hold my sister with the power of your love. Now lift those hands right where you stand. Father, I surrender to you right now. I surrender to you my biases, my prejudices, my frustrations. I surrender to you, Lord God, this idea that Saul is beyond redemption. I pray, God, that you will open up in our minds a space where regardless of our race and regardless of our background and regardless of our economic status, we will all see each other as within your reach, the redemptive power of your reach. And we say thank you, God. Thank you for the gift of this Sunday. Thank you for the gift of this community. God, that you will raise us up to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hope two or three people.